It started in about 15 seconds, everybody. We're uh, just about to go live on Facebook. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Sayer, I'm with Onward Eugene. And today we're gonna be talking about the new Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. So this is a program that has a ton of eligibility on ramps, meaning that it's uh, accessible to many. And actually it might be the first time that I'm aware of uh, where there has been this level of funding from the federal government to address the affordability issue um, in such a far reaching way. So this program is not just for rural areas, it's also for uh, urban areas as well. And uh, it is offered uh, by way of hundreds of different service providers across the country. Um, in Eugene, around Lane County, around Oregon, and around the nation. So I'm very thankful today to have a two-part agenda. Uh, we'll welcome Diane Coho from the FCC for a short presentation here in just a moment. Then we'll offer some Q&A from anyone in the audience that would like to chat. Chat's down at the bottom. I think it's open to everyone. Uh, chat a question there. And then with appreciation, we'll say goodbye to Diana from the FCC and welcome for two industry experts, our first from Comcast as well as Verizon. And one more thing that I'm super excited about and thankful for, uh, we'll be offering real-time Spanish translation during this webinar by way of Augustina and our friends at Go Global. So um, uh, for those who are looking to listen in on, in the Spanish language, it's right down at the bottom, somewhere right about there, uh, you hit the interpretation button, select Spanish, and Augustina has got you taken care of. So without further ado, uh, Diana, uh, hello from Eugene, Oregon. How are you today? Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here to talk about the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. I'm all the way on the East Coast, so uh, appreciate the opportunity. If you give me just a sec, I'll share my screen here so that uh, I do have a presentation to pull up here. Okay, Give me one more second. Can you see the presentation now? All right, wonderful, thank you. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the program, the benefit, who's eligible, how to apply, and some outreach toolkit materials that we have available to people to help spread the word. People like Matt, so thank you. So what is the benefit? There's a couple ways people can apply if they are quali from qualifying low-income households. Again, this program was created to help people stay online during the pandemic. Eligible households could receive up to $50 a month discount for broadband service and associated equipment rentals. So things like modems, routers, um, unless you're on eligible tribal lands, in which case it could be up to $75 a month discount. There's also an opportunity with some of the service providers to purchase a laptop, a desktop computer, or a tablet for a discount of up to $100 off. And in that instance, the consumer has to contribute over $10 and less than $50 toward the purchase price of the equipment. So to talk about who is eligible, it goes by household. So a household is eligible if any member of the household has received a Pell Grant in the current year, is approved to receive benefits under free or reduced school lunch program, school breakfast programs. There's a substantial loss of income criteria where someone has been laid off or lost their job since the end of February last year, and the household had a total income in 2020 of below 99,000 or twice that 198,000 for joint filers. There's also ways to meet the eligibility criteria by um, a participating providers existing COVID-19 or low income program. There's another way to qualify, which is households that are qualified for the lifeline benefit. Now this is a separate program on the left side there. You can see lifelines a federal program that lowers the monthly cost of phone and internet 
where customers can get up to $9.25 off the cost of monthly service or up to $34.25 on tribal lands. So again, this program, as well as emergency broadband benefit program, provides a discount on service. It's not a program where people would receive checks in the mail. Um, another way to qualify, so for Lifeline, the way to qualify is if the household income is less than 135% of the federal poverty guidelines, or there's a number of listed federal assistance programs. If people are receiving benefits through Medicaid, for example, uh, federal public housing assistance, some of the other listed programs there. So again, what is a household is very key here to determine who is eligible. Sometimes there could be more than one household at a single address, things like multi-generational households, some other examples I'll touch on in a minute. The key is to look at whether you're living together and sharing money and expenses. We do have a household worksheet, which is available. It's similar to the one for the Lifeline program for any of you that are familiar with that one to assist in determining household eligibility. Because again, the benefit is only uh, applies one per household. And sometimes as I have on my next slide, there could be more than one household at the same address. So things like homeless shelters, nursing homes, apartment buildings, other situations where there's more than one household at the same address also comes into play here. And there are scenarios, we have FAQs on our webpage, which I'll touch on in a minute, um, where you can look into this in more depth and see if possibly you could apply for the benefit, even though there could be an account holder, say for the entire building, or someone is helping to pay the bills and you could switch temporarily to using EVB support to pay for broadband service. Things to bear in mind is that this is a temporary program that was developed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It will end once the program funds are exhausted. There was a $3.2 billion appropriation for this program or six months after Health and Human Services declares an end to the pandemic, whichever happens first. The enrollment opened on May the 12th, and we currently have more than 2.3 million households enrolled. And I did send Matt the link. We, we now have a, a tracker. Um, actually, I should say USAC. They administer the Lifeline program as well as the emergency broadband program. And they have a tracker that's going to show every week how many households have enrolled. And once a month, it will show how many of the funds are remaining. So there are some consumer protections. There's a lot of concern about people being signed up for a program and then what happens when the benefit ends. So the service providers will notify people as they're being enrolled and also as the funding nears an end. So people will know when the program ends. And at that point, they will have to opt in to continue the service that they have or select a service plan. So, Participating providers can be found on our website, which is down here near the bottom, fcc.gov slash broadband benefit. And there's also a tool on the USAC website, which we'll talk about in a minute. It, the tool will show what type of services are being offered, either fixed or mobile, as well as whether or not they're participating in the device purchase program. So there are three ways to apply for the benefit by contacting a broadband service provider directly, going online to getemergencybroadband.org, and that is the one that USAC has set up as their consumer portal, or uh, you can mail in a copy of the application, which would have to be printed off, or it could be obtained from a service provider. And then it's important to include proof of eligibility. So the different program criteria, like Matt mentioned, there's a lot of ways that you can qualify and you need to include your supporting documentation. So if you enroll with the service provider, again, you can find them on our website or USAC has a tool on the getemergencybroadband.org site. Service providers can help a consumer in person. Again, everyone has to apply themselves and they have to verify and sign that their information is complete and accurate. So no one is being automatically enrolled in this program. And even people in the Lifeline program that are eligible, they have to opt in and they have to indicate that they want to participate. 
if you apply online, there's uh, buttons there to how to apply, and then you can upload your documents electronically to support the eligibility criteria that you are applying under. Once you receive an eligibility determination from the National Verifier, a consumer can then contact a service provider to enroll in the program. If you apply by mail, again, be sure to include your supporting documentation as well as eligibility and if it applies, the household worksheet. So there's a number of ways to show that you qualify. Again, depending on the eligibility criteria and your situation, at the getemergencybroadband.org, you can go to how to apply. It's here at the bottom of the slide. And then there's pull down menus to, to show what the documentation is that they're looking for. So example, if you had a substantial loss of income, maybe something like a furlough notice or proof that you applied for unemployment after that February 29th date of 2020. So last, I wanted to touch on the outreach toolkits. We have a number of materials available that you can tailor, co-brand, or just use as we have have them posted. There's a short presentation, a little bit shorter than this one. Uh, we we kind of have three types of materials. So one is social media images, draft posts, newsletters, that type of thing, inserts that you could put in newsletters, printable materials, graphics, handouts, posters, as well as multimedia video, audio PSAs, and um, an American Sign Language video. So I'll touch on these a little bit more and then we'll wrap this up so you can get to questions and the rest of your presentations today. So the social media images, you've kind of seen most of them already in this presentation, draft posts and the like are available printed materials that look like these. And again, you could tailor them if you would like. The American Sign Language video is important for people in the disability community, as well as some overview videos about the program and how to apply. I wanted to point this out because some of the materials are being translated into other languages. So in the middle here, it shows fact sheets, info cards, and the quarter page handout. On the left, we have 12 languages in alphabetical order that these materials will be available in. And then very importantly on the right here, alternate formats for people in the disability community. This 50, I'm sorry, FCC 504 at FCC.gov, that is our email inbox and that will outlive the EBB program. That is where people can request information in braille, large print and other formats to to address various types of special needs. So if you have questions, I think we have a, maybe a few minutes. Our consumer hub is fcc.gov slash broadband benefit. If you have specific questions, you can email us at broadbandbenefit at fcc.gov. The toll-free number for the Get Emergency Broadband, the USAC uh, hotline is 1-833-511-0311. And to apply online and look at their site, you can go to getemergencybroadband.org. So that is the presentation. Hopefully I covered everything uh, in just the right amount of time here. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing and give it back to you, Matt. Thank you. Thanks so much, Diana. We do have uh, a few questions for you if you have time. Um, one aspect about this program that I think bears repeating is that there are so many on-ramps for eligibility. Can you touch on those one more time? Sure. There, there's a couple different ways. So again, because this is an emergency broadband benefit due to the pandemic, there's the substantial loss of income. There's also Pell Grant recipients, the free and reduced school lunch programs. We've had questions. There's some some kids go to a school where the entire everyone in the school is getting that benefit. And so those families then would be able to apply because the child, again, it only has to be one person in the household receiving one of those benefits or one of the other listed programs, which also were listed under um, some other programs such as Medicaid and so forth. So if one member of the household is receiving one of those benefits or meets a criteria, then the household 
gets the benefit. And so that's one benefit for a household. That would be one discount of up to 50 a month or up to 75 on tribal lands, as well as one device purchase. Thank you. And we have a, a question from the audience. Uh, they asked to get a little more clarity on the, the use of the word household. So specifically <laughs> as it relates to uh, the unhoused population, um, uh, cell phones are pervasive uh, across all walks of life. And my initial thought there is perhaps they're receiving their bill at a PO box or another social service agency. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the FCC's thinking as it relates to the homeless community? Sure, I'm glad you asked that. And I will say that USAC has done a lot of work in this area and they've also done it for the Lifeline program. So there are ways to apply and put in not only an address, but actually a location. So perhaps there's a certain intersection or street area where, where they tend to, um, to be there. I would refer them to the USAC website is what I would do. And um, again, I'm sure it's very similar as what they've been doing for the Lifeline program. So yes. Perfect. Thank you. And then I think you also mentioned earlier, uh, and I heard this from the first time, which is um, this is uh, the word household can also mean in the context of a apartment building complex, but it also could mean like a homeless shelter itself. So the homeless shelter, if they're paying for internet services, could receive this discount sort of to support connectivity for their residents. There's a there's a lot of different options and scenarios. So again, I would have to refer you to the FAQs or to the USAC site because it's really hard to make a blanket statement. You know, every situation is so different. But again, we want people to be able to apply and to be eligible as a household. So a lot boils down to how is that defined? And there can be more than one household at a single address. So what happens is if a lot of applications come in at the same address, it could get flagged unless it's clear that this is a, a household and there's another household at the same address. So sometimes multi-dwelling, you know, like apartment buildings or homeless shelters, assisted living, nursing homes, there's a lot of ways that that can occur. And it all boils down to the right documentation to show that, yes, I'm at this address, but yes, there's other households there as well, qualifying households. Perfect, thank you. And just one more question uh, before we let you go. Uh, so you mentioned yesterday that the National Claim Tracker website uh, was announced. Um, what did we learn with that? Um, there's a ton of data there. Um, what, what are your initial observations? Well, I, I definitely can, you know, would like to say that it's great that we have it. We had so many questions going, you know, in the beginning about how will we know how many people are enrolled and, and where the funding levels are. And so the tracker should, should really provide some valuable insights there. It also showed, I believe it was it was in the first week or two, we had a million people and now it's, you know, we've got over twice that. So to really see how many households are enrolled. And then again, the, the drawdown of the funds will be on a monthly basis because that's how the, the money side will, will work, I'm sure. Because, you know, you get your bill once a month, right? So, and not everyone gets their bill the same day of the month. And that's part of what those notification requirements were about. So that people will know, they'll get notice when the funds are gonna run out and if it's gonna be mid cycle, how much money, you know, they will owe and this type of thing. So, so I think it'll be really valuable and people will see, uh, and, and like you did, you can also look up by state and say, hey, what, what's happening you know, in our area and how can we make sure that the people who qualify are aware of this and we have all the outreach toolkits for that too. So I think it should be great. Thank you for asking. Well, thank you, Diana. We appreciate the presentation and you uh, taking the time for our questions. That was, uh, this is a, such a great program and I'm hopeful that more local folks will take advantage of it based on what you just shared with us today. So thank you so much for visiting with us. Uh, it's now my pleasure to welcome forward two industry experts from Comcast and Verizon. And before I say their names, I want to make sure to thank our sponsors to, to whom which these, uh, this webinar was made free to the public. So thank you so much Comcast and the city of Eugene uh, we, we couldn't do this program without you and make it free to the public. So thank you for that support. So uh, without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome 
Beth Shariza, uh, Vice President, Regulatory Affairs at Comcast, and uh, Tamara Priest, uh, <coughs> Vice President, Public Affairs at Verizon. So welcome to the panel. Thank you so much for making time for us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. So, so Beth, let's start with you. Uh, one program that Com Comcast has had for years that uh, is widely popular um, is Internet Essentials. And can you tell us a little bit about what Internet Essentials is, just as a point of reference, and then how maybe Comcast is adopting the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program in tandem with that existing program? Sure, thank you. So Internet Essentials is Comcast's longstanding low-income adoption program. It started in 2011, and um, in, in its 10th year, it's connected a cumulative total of more than 10 million people to the Internet at home, uh, many of those people for the first time. And throughout that period, we've maintained um, the same price of $9.95 per month, uh, throughout the entire decade. It's available to, uh, to families of K-12 students, and we've expanded the program over the years to low-income veterans, those in public housing. And um, in terms of the EBB and the interplay with Internet Essentials, our Internet Essentials customers, whether they're existing customers or new Internet Essentials customers, are eligible for the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. We're offering the program on all of our tiers of service, including, um, including Internet Essentials. One thing that we've been doing with Internet Essentials during, um, during the pandemic period is offering two free months of service on the front end of the program that actually runs through the end of this month for um, applicants approved before, before June 30th. So where a new Internet Essentials customer would like to enroll in the EBB, we are giving them the two free months of Internet Essentials on the front end, and then they can go into the EBB program as well. Awesome, thank you. So the takeaway for me is you, you can double up uh, with both of these programs. And maybe, maybe just a quick follow-up uh, question. Can you talk to me about the application process for existing Internet Essential customers uh, I understand that there might be two different application processes with Comcast. Sure. So for our Internet Essentials program, what we did is we applied to the FCC, which was permissible for uh, companies that had a low income adoption program in place as of April 1 of last year. We applied to the FCC to be able to use our alternate verification process for our Internet Essentials customers, both existing and new. Um, it's slightly different and actually possibly a little more broad in some respects than, um, than the traditional Lifeline program, certainly uh, closer to the EBB program. So when um, an Internet Essentials customer would like to enroll in the EBB, all we have to do is get their consent to um, enroll in the program because we've already verified them through our alternate verification process. And we simply, after that consent, can enroll the consumer in the National Lifeline Accountability Database that's run by USAC and is the database where all, in, all EBB participants are enrolled. For, our, um, for consumers that choose to go into the EBB program and take one of Comcast's other tiers of service because we're making all of our tiers available, then the customer would go to the USAC National Verifier to um, get approved for the program and then would enroll with us in the EBB program and we would go through the same process to then um, put their information in the National Lifeline Accountability Database. Yeah, I really appreciate that Comcast is doing that. It, so it's, it's more than just getting a uh, potentially a discount on your existing service. If you want to upgrade your service to a faster tier, can be applicable in that way. So that part's great. That's uh, Tamara, uh, over to you. So Verizon has several uh, services that the benefit can be applied to, both cell plans uh, as well as home internet services. Tell me more about the different ways the EBB program can be used on Verizon services. 
Sure. First of all, thanks, Matt, for inviting us to participate in this. Um, certainly, we have all become acutely aware in the pandemic of how important connectivity is. Um, everybody working from home or doing remote schooling or contacting your doctors, whatever it is. So um, this is a, a great program. We appreciate that you're reaching out and making sure that the community is aware of this benefit. And thanks to the FCC and to Congress for doing the work to get us here. So yeah, we um, uh, Verizon is offering the EBB discount on all of our current um, mobile um, unlimited mix and match plans and also on our Fios plans, but we are not a wireline broadband provider in Oregon. Um, haven't been for many years since we uh, sold our, a lot of our wireline assets to Frontier. So in Oregon, what we're talking about is our um, unlimited mix and match programs on wireless. So that's a broadband data program. Also, we offer something called LTE Home, which is a fixed wireless. It's a home service, but fixed wireless. It's available in um, various parts of the state, generally more rural areas, though not entirely. Um, but if you're interested in enrolling in the broadband benefit program with Verizon and you call us and talk to us, we can let you know whether LTE Home is available where you're calling from. And we also offer the discount on mobile hotspot services. So the the mobile mix and match and the mobile hotspot that's available throughout um, all of Oregon. Um, so that should be broadly available. Um, I guess the um, most important thing to realize here is that um, sort of giving a little bit on lessons learned that a lot of customers or potential enrollees have had some trouble enrolling and it's because of a data mismatch problem. You A, a customer has to get qualified through um, that what people refer to as the national verifier and that's run by USAC and it'll ask various questions and you fill in and you provide your documentation that you're either, you know, you get your lifeline qualified or you're a Pell Grant recipient or whatever it is and you get verified. And then you come and you call Verizon and you say, I'm verified and I wanna sign up for Verizon service and get an EBB discount on that. And we sign you up and then we turn around and we send your information off to what Beth just referred to the NLAD and there's some sort of rejection problem. And a lot of that is a data matching problem. Now USAC I know is working on this and actually released some information earlier this week about some improvements you're gonna make over the course of the month of June to make it work better. But if you're helping someone enroll, some of the organizations that are on this, or if you're a consumer yourself, when you put in your name, address, date of birth, that information into the national verifier, you need to provide the exact same information to the provider. That means if you use a middle initial on one, you use the middle initial on the other. If you say you live on Elm Street, and you spell out street, S-T-R-E-E-T, -E -E make sure you spell it out with your provider and don't just use the abbreviation S-T. It sounds crazy, it's a little silly, but we all know that computers run the world and if your databases don't match, you're gonna have problems. So um, I just wanted to put that out there right away. We are seeing, and it's not just Verizon, I'm hearing this from all the providers, seeing a lot of problems where customers think they have enrolled successfully, they've established their, their, their eligibility, and then they have problems when they get to the service provider. So I wanted to get that tip out there. But again, this is supposed to be getting easier. A USAC will not require a match on all those elements. By later this month, it will be your application ID, your first and last name, and your date of birth. So a lot less margin for error there, which I think is a is I guess more margin for error there is a, it's a good thing that you won't have this thing with addresses and streets and all that, but um, just sort of word to the wise, be very careful of that when you're enrolling. Appreciate that uh, wisdom shared there uh, as, as the process sort of uh, optimizes itself. Uh, Beth, I wanna go back to you for uh, a question from a, a attendee. Uh, Donna says, I'm a low income senior and Comcast says that I have to be without service for 90 days before I can enroll in the EBB program. How can I get the program? Yeah, so let, let me try and address that. And I, I think there's a difference between the Internet Essentials program and the qualifications for that program and for EBB. So during the EBB period, that waiting, that waiting period does not apply and should not apply for the EBB program. So hopefully, um, hopefully we're not seeing that with the EBB program. And uh, you know, if we are, then I think you know we could educate some people. But folks have been educated as to that fact, 
and we shouldn't be seeing that issue for the EBB program specifically. Thanks so much, Beth. Uh, we got one more question for you. Uh, this comes to us from Jeff. Jeff shares that he went to get emergency broad, the Get Emergency Broadband website, which is the FCC website, uh, then went to Comcast to enroll. And it wasn't clear if uh, to, to Jeff if Comcast had received the application. Um, uh, so um, he's saying, I'm hoping the service provider can connect the dots on what to expect on their confirmation process. So can you can you share a little bit about what uh, subscribers should expect there? Sure. So, I, you know, I, I'm going to for a minute go back to what um, Chammer was talking about. And we have absolutely um, seen this issue across service providers where very often we're getting um, errors back from the Universal Service Administrative Company database. We are not sure um, what those errors are. We don't get specificity with respect to that information. And as uh, Tamara said, we're hoping that with the upgrades that USAC is doing, we're going to get a lot more information. So what we do is we will send um, an email back to the subscriber with information about, uh, but it's high level information again, because we don't know um, what some of these errors are because of the lack of specificity that we're getting back from the USAC error process. But we are um, sending emails to applicants to let them know if there is a um, some type of error and whether they need to go back in to say the national verifier. And as uh, Tamara noted, we verify their information to make sure that the exact information that they've put in the national verifier precisely matches the information that they're giving Comcast for the enrollment. So a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of learnings here. USAC uh, put this, um, put their systems up in just an extremely short period of time, uh, an extremely dedicated group of people. The FCC put this program together in an extremely short period of time and service providers as well um, had a very short period of time to get this up and running. We're still feeling our way through this program. Uh, everybody's working really hard to get things running more smoothly and hoping as the program um, is ongoing that we do see you know, less glitches, more smooth running processes and, and think that this USAC um, upgrades coming shortly will help a lot. Can I just add to that a little bit? Um, I, I, we've gotten questions from a lot of organizations, from state commissions, from state AG's offices, you know, why are we making it so hard for our customers? Why do we have to jump through all these hoops? These are the federal requirements. You have to have a match between what's put in the national verifier and what we send to the NLAT. And it, it's just hard. And it's going to get a lot easier because by the end of the month, USAC, I hope, fingers crossed, is arranging for the provider to be able to see the information that was input into the national verifier so we can make sure that we can make that match. But it's, it, it's just, you know, <laughs> those are the rules and, and we have to deal with them. And, and we're trying very hard to work with customers. And we're sorry that it takes multiple phone calls sometimes to get this stuff straightened out. But we are looking for program improvements by the end of the month. And again, USAC had to stand up this program in 60 days. That's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, it, it sounds like um, uh, things are working because we have uh, over 3 million people who have been enrolled. Uh, but for some, there are these little glitches that are, are getting worked out. And, it, and that's very promising that the USAC system will advise of the glitch before it rejects um, at the end of the month. So thank you for that insight. And thank you, Donna, for your question. Also, Jeff, for your question. Uh, Tamara, another question for you. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm based here in Eugene, Oregon. We're a college town, go Ducks. Uh, and I think that we heard uh, earlier that there are some provisions in this program specifically for students. Uh, can you walk us through those, the eligibility generally speaking for students? Sure, um, you're absolutely right that the emergency broadband benefit program has broader eligibility criteria than the traditional lifeline program. And the one thing that is aimed directly at students that was added is um, if the student is a recipient of a Pell Grant um, during the year that they're applying, then that makes them eligible. Nothing else, a single criteria, Pell Grant criteria, so you're eligible. So I think that's gonna be very helpful for, um, for a number of students. 
And then of course, students may fall into other eligibility criteria or categories too. Um, if you're not a college student yet, but you're hoping to get there, um, you know, if you're free or reduced price school lunch, the school breakfast program, um, it, or if you're a student who's you know, working, supporting yourself as you're getting through college, you may uh, qualify based on income, the 135% of the federal poverty level, or if you had a loss of income in this last year since um, February 29th of 2020, as Diana explained before, and you can document that, that's another way to establish eligibility, plus other things like federal housing assistance or the um, you know, food stamps or anything like that. So they're the they're the, sort of the traditional criteria, but they added for EBB the Pell Grant and the free and reduced price school lunches. So both of those should be helpful to students at different levels. That's super helpful. Um, yeah, th there's just so many great uh, uh, aspects or features of this new program in terms of how inclusive it is. Um, thank you for adding a little bit more color on some of those student on ramps. Uh, Beth, back to you. Um, how long might this program last? Uh, it's a good thing. How, how long do you think it might last? And I know it's just a guess. And is there any possibility that it could be extended? Yeah, so I think um, so. I think a guess is is the right way to put it in terms of the program um, um, duration. But I think we, we really don't know. And I think what we will um, we'll have a better idea after we see, I think, the first months of reimbursement claims. The FCC gave providers a, uh, a waiver, a blanket waiver of an additional month to, um, to submit their reimbursement claims for May and June. And uh, part of that, I think, is, you know, we're seeing all these, again, what uh, Chamber mentioned with mismatches and things of that nature, where we really want to try and get this information into the systems. So I think once we see um, that first month of claims, which will actually be two months worth of claims, I think then we can look at a, a run rate for the system uh, because we don't know um, exactly whether every consumer is, and we know that every consumer is not getting necessarily a $50 credit or a $75 credit in a tribal area. For instance, if you're, um, if you're enrolled in the program with Comcast Internet Essentials Program, then that's $9.95 a month, and the credit to the customer is $9.95. So um, once we see the run rate, we'll know um, a little more, and also devices. We don't know how many devices have been uh, provided under the program, and that's another factor. It is possible, though, that uh, Congress refills the coffers here, and the program um, extends for an additional period of time after the $3.2 um, billion is exhausted. So absolutely uh, a possibility. Well, fingers crossed there uh, for additional follow-on funding. Uh, Tamara, so eventually this program will sunset. Um, how does Verizon plan to notify its customers uh, when that date is actually known? Right, so that's an excellent question because we want people to realize that if and when the program, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed for additional congressional appropriations and it doesn't end. But um, assuming that it does, um, the FCC has been very clear that we want to make sure customers understand it is a temporary benefit. It will come to an end at some point and give customers maximum transparency and maximum flexibility about what they do, what they choose to do when the program ends. So first of all, everybody signing up for EBB knows, is informed, the service providers have to disclose that it is a temporary program. It lasts until the money runs out or six months after um, the end of the pandemic emergency is declared, whichever comes first. You actually have to certify that to that when you enroll, so everyone understands that. Then, um, and, and, and that's also in all of our uh, customer-facing materials on our website, any of the collateral that you know, Diana talked about, if providers are doing that, everything has to make clear that it's a temporary program. Um, second, the, gov the government, the FCC, has committed to give providers 60 days notice um, of when funds will run out. And that's hard. It's a really hard thing to do for all the reasons that Beth just identified. We don't really know how many, you know, we don't know until they sign up how many customers are gonna be. We don't know until the bills go out exactly what the discount will be because it'll depend on you know, how much you're paying. We don't know how many people take devices. So the government, the FCC is working hard to figure out how to track a runway so they can tell us 
60 days before the money will run out, at which point we stop enrolling new customers in the EBV. And then after we get that notice, we then provide notice to all of our EBB enrollees of the projected date that the money will run out. So that's one notice. And then 30 days before the end of the EBB program, we will notify again, all of our EBB enrollees that the um, program is gonna end, the discount will end, and what price they would be paying for their service um, after the discount ends. So let's say it were a $70 service with the EBB discount, you're getting $50, you're paying 20. We need to let the, every enrollee know that, well, when this program ends, the money runs out, you'll be paying 70 again. And at that point, um, do you want to continue service? And this is really important, whether you're a new customer who only became, in this case, a Verizon customer for the EBB, or you had been a Verizon customer for years before you qualify for the EBB, you're getting this discount, you, ha you have to affirmatively opt in to continue to receive service at the undiscounted rate at the end of the program. So in the example that I gave, you have to affirmatively tell Verizon, yes, I wanna to continue to receive service at that $70 rate when the money runs out, or alternatively, I don't want that rate, I wanna sign up for a different Verizon offering that maybe costs less or what have you, but you have to tell us that. If we don't get affirmative opt-in, the FCC's rules require us to terminate the broadband service. This is to prevent any rate shock, to prevent any customer from getting a bill that was higher than they expected that you know, maybe they were paying nothing because the EBB benefit covered everything. So this is a way of ensuring that customers are fully informed, have their options in front of them and aren't surprised by any bill they get when the program ends. And, and that applies to all providers. So this is how Verizon's doing it, but we all have to do this. I appreciate the uh, thoughtfulness that's gone into uh, uh, sort of a soft sunset on things on the tail end so that there's no surprises for, for any subscribers. Hey, hey, Beth, I have another question for you. Uh, Comcast sometimes offers uh, promotional rates, uh, especially when uh, folks sign up for the service for the first time. How might it work if uh, someone is also eligible for EBB as it relates to uh, those promotional rates? So um, two things, if you were an existing customer and you were on a promotion that was um, in place as of December 1st of, of 2020, um, you can, can you enter EBB and you remain on that promotion. So, you know, let's say your promotional um, rate is, um, is, uh, is $60, then you're going to get a, the benefit of um, $50 off of that. And, um, and, but you remain on your promotion. So whether you're on a grandfathered rate, um, an existing rate, standard rate, a promotional rate, you, or internet essentials, you can enter the EBB program on that, um, on that promotion. If we had a new promotion that started after the EBB program started, as long as that tier of service was in existence, as of December 1st of 2020, the exact upload and download speed tier of service, and the promotional rate is lower than the rate that existed back in December of, um, of 2020, then you can, you know, a new subscriber can take that promotion as well with the EBB program. That's similar for us too. Um, for instance, we have, leaving aside promotions, we also have discounts for certain categories of customers. Like we have a military discount called those who serve or, or discounts for teachers or nurses, all those. If you were getting the discount, you continue to get the discount and your EBB discount will be added to that. Thank you, that's super helpful. Um, I think we have maybe exhausted some of the, the attendee questions. So uh, Beth, uh, any closing thoughts on this program or anything else that you think um, folks out there should know? Yeah, I, I just like to say, I think this is um, just a great program. I really do give a lot of credit to the FCC and to USAC for getting this program stood up so incredibly quickly. Um, it's very complex. There are a lot of systems uh, changes and modifications that needed to be made at USAC. And, um, and it's, I just think, a great testament to the program that um, we now have over 1,000 
service providers, I believe, was the latest information that are participating in this program. I'd like everybody to know that, um, that service providers are working very hard with USAC. They've been extremely accommodating um, and the FCC to really try and make the improvements like the improvements that uh, Tamara talked about that are going into effect so that we can hopefully make signups uh, smoother as this program goes along for consumers. That's our objective here. And, uh, and really, you know, appreciate though, all the support from, um, from our community partners that have also tried to get the word out on this program. Folks are doing a great job and we thank everybody. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Tamara, uh, closing remarks. Yeah, I don't want to be a copycat, but um, I, I, but I will be. I mean, I think it is really important to realize that the FCC and USAC have done tremendous work over the time period. That they, like I said, they had sixty days to stand this up, and when they're making changes that need to be made, they're making them on the fly. Um, seeing what, how challenging it was for us to implement all the billing system and changes within Verizon, um, I can only imagine you know trying to do that or to anticipate what every provider might experience. So it's it's got to be. Um, very challenging for the government. So hats off to them. And also um, when we talk about these problems with enrollment, the data matches, this is where the um, organization like yours and some of the folks on this call have just done God's work. I mean, helping people, if you can help people navigate this, it can be very frustrating and nobody likes that, but if you can help people navigate the process and get to the happy spot where they are enrolled, that's just wonderful work. And we really appreciate the effort um, of all the organizations that are doing that. Um, I wanted to say something that I meant to say at the beginning and it came from a, a question I got yesterday on this. I said we were, op we were offering the um, service um, for Oregon purposes on um, our, our mobile mix and match plans, our LTE home plan, and I talked about mobile hotspots. And I just wanna um, emphasize that may not be as familiar to everybody, but basically a mobile hotspot is a, a, a piece of equipment that allows you to create kind of your own Wi-Fi network. So you can connect multiple devices to your um, this hotspot and get connectivity. And that's something that has proven to be very, very pre-EVB, very popular during the pandemic. We've done work um, with a lot of states, a lot of school districts, including in Oregon, to provide mobile hotspots and uh, data allotments, you know, data services to allow students to work to do school remotely because you know all of a sudden everybody had to have a computer to go to school. So um, if people are unfamiliar with mobile hotspots and how they work, that's a, that's another option that um, folks might want to might want to consider. And certainly when you're calling your provider, whether it's Verizon or um, in case of mobile hotspots, another wireless provider, that's an option you might just want to ask about because you may have multiple users and you're you know they, using different types of devices to connect. Kind of out of left field, but someone asked me that yesterday. So no, no, uh, it's an important important point, and um, maybe just a couple of thoughts off the cuff for me. Um, having seen that USAC website for the first time uh, this morning or last night, um, it's um, encouraging that over two million people have uh, enrolled. However, there are only eighteen thousand one hundred and seventy one people in Oregon, so. I think uh, looking at the attendees here, I see some folks who have very large microphones and can be helpful in spreading the word. And so I would implore you to do so, um, to, to spread the word about this really helpful program, uh, both in the education space and the low income space in general. Uh, uh, there's um, an opportunity to spread awareness together. So I'm so thankful to you, Beth and Tamara and Diana out there. Uh, for making time for us here in Oregon, uh, helping spread the word. I want to say thank you to the city of Eugene for your partnership in helping us uh, do this public service announcement associated with this, this program and, and helping us get coverage from the Registrar Guard and other media outlets to spread the word here. Uh, also want to say uh, thank you to Comcast for your support along similar lines. And last but not least, uh, Augustina, hopefully you're still out there translating to, to Spanish and our friends at Go Global. Thank you all for making time. Thank you for all the attendees who asked questions. Uh, please spread the word about this program and we'll be posting this video out onto YouTube so you can uh, easily share it and get the word out. And uh, thank you all for making time during your lunch hour or in your afternoon over there on the East Coast. 
uh, appreciation from Onward Eugene and the entire community over here in Oregon. So have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.